Hello guys and welcome back to yet another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the original cheese grater Mac, the Power Mac G5. And back at WWDC 2003, Apple had one more thing to announce. There is one more thing we wanted to talk about today. <clears throat> Here it is. <clears throat> this is an all aluminum enclosure. This new computer has 64-bit processors, up to two of them at a blazing fast for the time 2 gigahertz and up to 8 gigabytes of RAM. For 2003, the Apple Power Mac G5 was definitely a screamer. And I'm not just talking figuratively. These machines are notoriously loud, power hungry and are literal dust magnets with all the air they suck in for cooling. My Power Mac G5 definitely needs a good clean. So let's make this cheese grater Mac shine once again. Before we clean it out, let's power it up and see if it still works. When I tried to boot up the system, all I got was the small no disk found icon. Meaning either the primary hard disk has been wiped or is no longer functional. Next, I plugged in my macOS Leopard 10.5 install USB. This is actually the newest version of macOS that'll run on these G5 systems. Still, when I held down option, nothing showed up at all. After doing some research, I learned that I could hold down control option O and F to get into the open firmware. I then typed dev alias to bring up a list of all the systems connected IO. I searched for UD, which is short for USB device. I could see my Leopard boot device was indeed detected, so I typed the command boot ud colon comma double backslash colon tbxi, and like magic, the G5 booted to my install USB. In the disk utility, it didn't actually detect any hard drives at all, so I can assume it simply doesn't work. My solution is to install this 120 gigabyte Kingston SATA based SSD. Now it's worth keeping in mind that the Power Mac G5 only has a SATA 1 interface, meaning the maximum throughput is only about 1.5 gigabits per second, or roughly 150 megabytes per second. The SSD will greatly improve the read and write speeds regardless of the SATA connection type. I just placed it in the case and will remove it before we clean the computer. Luckily the SSD showed up in the disk utility. SATA 3 backwards compatibility with SATA 1 can be hit or miss at the best of times. So, I installed macOS 10.5 and a short time later, we had a working system. Gosh, I really miss these first time boot videos. It seemed quite fast. To make it as usable as possible, I'll also max out the RAM once we've cleaned the system out. Unlike the higher spec models, this G5 can only accept a maximum of 4GB of DDR RAM across its 4 RAM dims. This base model 2GHz dual processor 2005 Power Mac costs $1000 less than the high end model from 2003. The base model Power Mac G5 we have here also has double the video memory at 128MB on its ATI Radeon 9600, but holy heck is it dusty. Opening the Power Mac is very easy, the side comes off when you release the latch at the back. Inside there's a plastic airflow door which is held in place magnetically. Next we'll remove the cooling fans. These and many other components will be thoroughly dusted off. With a single Phillips head screw, the passively cooled graphics card can be removed along with the hard disk. I then remove the IDE DVD burner which had a surprising amount of rust on it. The metal plate above the CPUs proved difficult to remove. After some tinkering, I figured out that there was a plastic rivet holding the cover in place. I can't for the life of me work out a reason why it would be there apart from making it slightly harder to access the processors. I tried squeezing out the rivet with my multi-tool, but it was just too hard to get a good grip on. Since this rivet is never going to be used or put back in the machine again, I chose the brute force option. With some patience, actually worked. Sliding the plate across, we have our first look at the beefy CPU heatsinks. One for each PowerPC G5 processor. In an age before multi-core CPUs, this computer actually had two single core processors that Apple were claiming were pretty darn powerful in their keynote back in 2003. The CPU exhaust fans were next to come out, along with this small plastic bracket. Removing the CPUs was actually a bit tricky. You needed a really long screwdriver, but one trip to Bunnings and 1195 later, I had the tool I needed. After a few attempts, I had all of the CPU screws removed and I could finally uninstall them. 
With a bit of wiggling, they came right off. I'll be sure to apply some new thermal paste later in the video. The RAM was next to come out. Honestly, I'm very surprised how much dust had built up on these over the years. The power supply in this G5 is hidden away underneath this metal plate, which is held in place by two Phillips head screws. I unplugged all of the power connections and unscrewed the metal plate. When pushed forward, the dusty plate finally came out, revealing the massive power supply within. With some careful maneuvering, it was free. The lack of any dust filters really makes the Power Mac G5 a dust collection champion. Just look at all that dust. It's now time to use some high pressure air to remove as much of the dust as we can. This computer must have been used in a humid and or moist environment for the dust to collect like this. Turns out even high pressure air wasn't enough to remove the dust. So I've resorted to using a small brush and then sucking up all the dust using our vacuum cleaner. The graphics card looks so much better after all this dusting. For some reason I also cleaned the hard disk even though it doesn't work. Don't ask me why. The cooling fans needed a lot of brushing. I got into every crevice I could and I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. The fan with the built-in speaker was absolutely loaded with dust. How does this even happen? I'm going to guess it was over 10 years of working in a dust-filled environment. But once again, this wasn't something that would stop my brush from sufficiently cleaning that fan. The optical drive wasn't overly dusty, but the metal had pretty serious pitting and the front bracket had a lot of rust on it. I started off by dusting the power supply as much as I could, even spinning up the fans using the vacuum cleaner. The real fun began when I used high pressure air to remove all the dust within. Oh boy was there a lot of dust. While I could definitely have opened up the power supply, I feel this method got rid of most of the dust at the very least. It's finally time to dust out the case. It's just so satisfying seeing all of that dust go everywhere. The thermal paste in a 14 year old computer definitely needs replacing, and I'll be putting new paste on each CPU. To get access to the CPU lid, I removed all six of the Phillips head screws and four mounting hex screws that hold the CPU card to the cooler plate. With some careful wiggling, I managed to get it free. This was somewhat difficult until I realized how to unhook the card. Next, I removed the old thermal paste using a Q-tip and some isopropyl alcohol. With the surface looking clean and free of debris, I applied a small blob of new thermal paste. Once the cooling plate is put back, this will spread evenly over the CPU lid. I also cleaned off the cooling plate with some isopropyl alcohol. The old thermal paste had definitely hardened, but that's to be expected. Putting the CPU card back on was a pretty simple process. I clipped the board back into place and screwed the screws back in. I repeated all of these steps with the second processor. I noticed the second processor had a lot more thermal paste on the sides of the CPU lid. Turns out you can remove the small plastic cover. I got in and around the small CPU lid with some isopropyl alcohol and got it looking clean as a bean. So I applied a tiny amount of glue to the corners and let it dry. With the CPUs back together, it was time to give the outer casing a much needed clean. I used some methylated spirits on an antibacterial wipe. This was very effective at cleaning the surfaces. Aside from some small scratches, the case of the Power Mac is in very good condition for its age. Next, I wiped down the feet, which still had their rubber pads. The front grille also came up looking great. Having front USB, firewire, and headphone jack is a very convenient feature. The back of the machine also cleaned up really well. The selection of ports is a very strong point of this desktop. I made sure to also clean underneath the latch. With the case cleaned inside and out, I reassembled the computer. The power supply was the first component to go back in. With the logic board still inside, it was a bit of a squeeze. After several attempts, it was in. The metal cover slotted back in with ease. I then screwed the cover and power supply into place. The two CPU brackets were screwed in next. I placed each processor back in very carefully because I did not want to damage the connector pins. I had trouble keeping the long CPU screws magnetized to the driver. So I put a small amount of blue tack in each hex screw. This was very effective and every screw went back in without issue. Next, I put the fans in, graphics card and hard disk. To make the SSD fit properly in the 3.5 inch hard drive bay, I bought a cheap 3.5 to 2.5 inch SSD bracket off of eBay. Just a word of caution, don't cheap out on the drive bracket. 
The edges of the metal were very sharp and I actually cut my hands in several places. The screw holes were also not drilled for the standard 3.5 inch drive screw thread. Once the screws were on, the SSD slotted into place fine. With the machine back together, I tried to turn it on and nothing at all happened. Not a single light or sound. I thought I'd actually killed it. I opened it back up and tried to diagnose the problem. When I had one of the CPUs out, I discovered that some dust had actually made its way to the connector pins. In fact, I can even see it looking back at the footage. With the dust removed, I put the CPUs back on. This time we had signs of life, but now we were getting an error code. Two flashes from the front LED. This has to do with RAM. And I'll cut the story short, I tried over 20 different RAM sticks in various configurations. I knew the RAM had to be put in in pairs, but I assumed like this. However, the first pair was supposed to go in the middle two slots, and then the second pair on the outer slots. I should have read the labeling on the motherboard a lot more carefully. Anyway, now the G5 with its cleaned out case, new thermal paste, SSD, and maxed out 4GB of RAM can be put to use. While the PAL PC processors are very limiting when it comes to modern software compatibility, I found the machine to be very responsive, and this is likely due to the SSD. To start off, I installed iLife 2009, which is thankfully compatible with PAL PC based systems. This will enable us to be able to edit a video in iMovie. I also installed 10.4 Fox web browser and a compatible PAL PC version of VLC player. Much to my surprise, this old G5 tower was actually somewhat capable. YouTube playback while recording in GarageBand was very smooth. Basic photo editing in iPhoto was also fine. When it came to gaming, I tried out Halo Combat Evolved, a longtime favorite of mine. This ran pretty smooth, even at 1280x800 on medium settings. Last of all, I edited together a short sequence with footage I shot of this very Power Mac. I downscaled the 4K footage to 1080p using a program called Handbrake, and I had no trouble whatsoever editing that footage in iMovie. When it came time to render, I tried swapping out the optimized footage that iMovie had created with the source clips to hopefully remove the terrible artifacting iMovie is known for. Sadly, this didn't work, so I rendered the video at 1080p, highest quality settings with two encoding passes, using iMovie's horrendous optimized footage option. This took about 15 minutes to render a 29 second sequence. Watching the video, we can see a small amount of artifacting in the dark areas of the image. With YouTube compression, I doubt you'll even notice though. So there we have it, Apple's original cheese grater Mac. Honestly, this 16 year old design has aged very well, and I'm so glad that I've restored this machine. Is it still a viable option in 2019? In the case of this model, Yes, web browsing and basic tasks are still achievable, but the outdated PowerPC architecture is really showing its age with a lot of software incompatibility. Thank you very much for watching. Regular videos should be out very soon. I've actually had a lot of fun dealing with this G5 Power Mac, even with all the technical difficulties. So, if you've enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like, and if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing. I'll see you in the next video.